So uh, my name is David Workley. Um, I, I don't have a medical background, so I'll say that right from the very beginning. Um, but I have been involved in what our next speaker is going to talk about, uh, personal health management, the use of wearable technologies and lifestyle medicine for managing my own health. So I've done a lot of uh, research into the, the technologies and I've kept up to date with um, what is available to be able to manage my own health. And I've seen some uh, remarkable results, not just from, from my own personal health, which fortunately has always been reasonably good, um, but also in the health and well-being of other people. So that that is me. Um, I'm going to, if I can use this technology. So I'm going to be talking about a number of different things, um, but I think it's very important right at the very beginning to put things into context, why I'm interested in this and why I think all of us should be interested in this. Um, our introductory uh, speaker uh, is from the NHS uh, in the UK. Um, and we're both familiar with some of the challenges of the NHS, which I think she will uh, relate to as I go through my, my, my presentation. But we all face problems with the sustainability of public health services wherever you are in the world and i just want to talk about one particular technology or one particular aspect which i think has got uh, quite a bit of potential in addressing some of the challenges that i'm going to uh, refer to so I think this is really, this is a picture of my mother, by the way. Uh, my mother um, had dementia. Uh, she spent the, the last few weeks of her life in a care home. Uh, this was taken at uh, Ketchum General Hospital in the UK. Uh, when she'd been taken in, she'd been living in a, uh, a care home for two or three years um, and unfortunately uh, she wasn't properly cared for and she suffered from severe dehydration uh, and nearly died uh, so that that is her in the hospital bed in in Kesheri. unfortunately they were able to uh, to help her survive uh, the problem but she in my opinion is kind of indicative of some of the challenges that we face today we're, we're living longer which is a good thing, but the problem is that we have quite a few years, last years of our life in, in, in poor health. So we need more care as we age, and there are fewer working people to cover the costs of this additional health care. Um, and this is a, a change in society, but caring for older people used to be a family responsibility. But now it's shifted, and it's true in my case, from family responsibility to care homes. And elderly care has been, in the last few years, in my opinion, um, a poor relation of public health services. And coronavirus particularly exposed our vulnerability to the unsustainability of public health services. So this is a graphic to kind of express what the challenge is. Uh, there, there are more costs involved in caring for older people so as we age the cost burden gets higher and there are less and less people uh, available to be able to support that burden so it's an imbalance in the cost of healthcare services uh, i i took this shot literally probably about an hour ago there's a, a web page called death meter uh, which it shows from who estimates uh, what people are dying of. And I, I apologise that the text is very small, uh, but essentially the number one cause of uh, death in the world today is coronary artery disease, followed by COPD, lower, lower respiratory tract infections, Alzheimer's disease and dementia, trachea bronchus, lung cancers, diabetes, and so, so it goes on. Um, but what we die of today primarily um, is non-communicable diseases, NCDs. These are not infections that are passed on from person to person. Even when coronavirus was at its height, there were more people dying from NCDs than there were from, uh, from, from COVID. So what are the solutions that are available? Well, on one side, we've got opportunities to try and develop preventative healthcare solutions. 
the other option is to improve the productivity of our existing healthcare services. So on, on the prevention side, um, we have an option that we can develop better and more drug solutions, pharmaceutical interventions, uh, vaccines, etc., which have been lifesavers, uh, ad admittedly. Um, or uh, we can try and influence people's lifestyles because it's most of people die today of lifestyle related conditions. But on the productivity side, uh, we can use technology to improve the productivity of, 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 of our staff. And I, the reason why I show a nurse with an iPad uh, there is because this is what I observe um, and other people observe as one of the the changes in roles and responsibilities brought about as a result of technology. And increasingly, nurses, and I, and I don't use the, the term lower grade stuff, but lower, lower level stuff, beyond, below the doctors and uh, the consultants, uh, but it's the, the nurses who are able to do much higher grade work because of the uh, value of, of the technologies available today. So non-communicable diseases are the biggest cause of uh, mortality. And unfortunately, um, I think in many instances, we choose to go down drugs and pharmaceutical options. Because if you are a hard pressed doctor, uh, then and an individual suffering from a problem, the easy option, the thing we want, look, fix the problem, give me something to take that will cure me. That's much easier as an option than to say, well, you've got to change your lifestyle. You've got to eat healthier. You've got to exercise. And for many people, that is a less attractive option than just being able to take a, uh, a pill. So oh, 10 years ago now, the, um, the head of the National Health Service at the time, Sir Simon Stevens, he uh, really posted a, a, a warning. Uh, that we need to make this transition from cure to prevention. And key to that is changing in uh, behavioral change in our lifestyles. And so what Simon Stephen was saying is that unless we do something about it, and the NHS and other public health services will collapse because there will not be the resources to support uh, the, the, the challenges. Uh, and he said, we need to do this as early as possible, right from child age. We need to um, educate our children and people of all ages to start healthy lifestyles as early as possible. Because the older you get, the more difficult it is to, to do this. So our next presenter is going to be talking about this in more detail. But uh, this is how I started my journey 10, 10 years ago. Um, my background, I've been the founding director of the Serious Games Institute at Coventry University. Um, and so I developed an expertise in what's called gamification, uh, the use of game psychology and mechanics uh, to influence behaviours. Uh, so some 10 years ago, um, the result of things, nothing really to do with, with bad health. It was my, mainly people telling me I was fat uh, and they were... <laughs> And they were worried about me. Uh, and an academic friend of mine said, "You should get a you should get a DNA test because I think you've got Russian blood in you. You look like a big Russian bear." Um, uh, and so all of these things went like water off a duck's back. But um, I, when I got my DNA test back, my genetic origins are not anything to do with the USSR, but. Uh, what it did say, I got a 50% greater chance of getting diabetes too. And that did make me think. Um, and so when I found out about um, a device that could track my steps every day, I got something to, to measure my, my, my performance. It also tracked my sleep and it also allowed me to put in, type in what I ate uh, and, it, and it worked out the calorific value of that. So I, I got some basic tools 10 years ago to start managing my own health. And, and this is what happened. So this is me in 1998. And you can see what people said I, I, I was fat. Um, and this was me in 2008 presenting in Kuala Lumpur. Um, and this is me May 2013. And within three months of starting, I'd lost 21 kilos just by measuring my steps and keeping my calories 
consuming my less calories than uh, I, I expended. So I know for a fact from my own experience that um, these substantial improvements are in physical, not only physical, mental health. I've seen the benefits for myself. Um, and over the last 10 years, I'm not trying to boast about this, but every single day, almost every single day, uh, with, a, with a few, very few exceptions, I walk five miles every day. Um, uh, but I've learned, I've educated myself that diet is actually more important than, uh, than, than exercise. And I'll go into this story in a little bit more, more detail. So these, in my opinion, are the, the key health and well-being influence. These are the things that you, if you can have control over, they will make a big important uh, to your quality of your life, both physical and mental health. And I discovered almost through experimentation myself, the importance of hydration, um, uh, the importance of sleep, and the importance of diet. I learned all of these things uh, myself, and it was only two years ago that I discovered there was actually something called lifestyle medicine. And there is a British Society of Lifestyle Medicine, and they have exactly the same kind of principles uh, of their strategy. So, the steps that I talk and the steps uh, I think that uh, most people uh, can, can follow. First of all, you need to be able to measure these things if you're going to be able to control them. You can't control anything you can't measure. You need also then to create personal benchmarks because what worked for me won't necessarily work for you or for other people. So not everybody can walk 10,000 steps. If you're in a wheelchair, that's an impossibility. So you need benchmarks that are relevant to you and your lifestyle. And you use those benchmarks to set achievable goals. So basically you're saying, this is where I am now, health-wise. Um, and this is what I think I can do in my, in, in my, with my lifestyle and the way where I live, my relationships, et cetera. And if you can build a supporting uh, environment with, with, with family uh, and, and habits, et cetera, uh, developing good habits, uh, you can, with the aid of supporting digital therapies and taking responsibility for your own health, uh, you can make a big difference to your life. And where digital twins come into this, and um, I can't demonstrate them, unfortunately, uh, to you today, but um, uh, one of the things that we are literally on the cusp of is having a digital twin, maybe on our, on our smartphone, as a health coach. Somebody you can literally talk to, uh, get advice from, uh, and give personal advice which is related to you, as long as you've got the tools to be able to measure your, your health. So going, stepping back now, uh, I want, want you to think about what we mean by twin. What is a twin in medicine? Uh, because I would argue that the diagram that you see, very early diagram, anatomical diagrams, they're a twin. Uh, they're somebody's representation of what a human being inside of a human being looks like. So we've created twins uh, to help us understand what goes on within our body. Um, and, and these twins, very basic anatomical twins. And of course, we're all different. So if you open me up, you probably a lot of familiar things inside me to, to what you see there, but not exactly the same. On the right side, this is a digital twin, a digital twin of me, actually. Um, and I'm using... Uh, a technology that I've, I've just been piloting for the last uh, last three weeks. Um, but this is my blood sugar levels uh, tracked in real time. So I've been using a device called Freestyle Libra. Um, and so I can track how my blood sugar responds to whatever I eat. Uh, and this is part of a, a new solution in the UK uh, designed to help people improve their diet, their gut health, their blood health, and their, um, and their blood uh, sugar uh, responses. So that's a digital twin. It's actually a twin of me. That, that is me represented in a graphical format. Um, so you could argue that uh, a twin is just basically a, a duplicate, a clone, or, or just a visualization of uh, a human being. Now, here we have some uh, digital twins. I, I did... Uh, 
say to apologize to Elvessa because I, I found her picture on the internet and I used her as an example to create a digital twin. So the picture that I found on the internet is the, the middle one. And then on the far side, I said, well, make Elvessa a doctor uh, in Singapore. So the background, although you can't, it's a bit blurred, is actually Singapore and she is in a nurse's outfit. And I did all of that on my smartphone. And she'll tell me, I, I sat with her this morning just for a few minutes and I, uh, and I got, uh, made her avatar uh, speak French. So she did a presentation in French and literally within about five minutes, wasn't it? Yeah, about five minutes. I, I wanted to be able to demonstrate that to you live today, but unfortunately, uh, because I can't use my laptop because we are online, I, I can't do that. But if any of you would like to have your digital twin made today, come and see me um, in the coffee break or something, I'll make a digital twin of you. You could tell me what language you would love to speak, whether it's Russian, Chinese, Urdu. Um, I have many languages I can choose from, and I can make you an expert in in any of these uh, any of these languages in in a matter of a uh, few minutes on a smartphone not a laptop my smartphone so digital twins there's many types of digital twin not just used in medicine um, but these are used in uh, digital twins of cities for example so that uh, you can explore a city you can model a city to see how it's going to behave in real life in the automotive industry, uh, increasingly are using digital twins of cars so that you can experience being in the car uh, before it's ever manufactured. Um, and of course, in, in medicine, we have uh, visualizations and representations that are used in medical uh, education. But this is something that is not new. And this is where my, um, if you like, my, my background comes into play because I got first got involved in in what you can see obviously as a, as a digital twin um, 17 years ago this is 17 years ago uh, a computer games company in uh, the UK called Blitz Games one of the leaders one of the biggest independent games companies in the world they recognize the potential of games technologies for serious purposes and that's how the serious games institute came to play so they did a uh, an experiment to see if they could simulate, uh, could scan a, a person and simulate what uh, it looks like when a person dies from a head injury and show that in 60 seconds. So this is what it was called the Dying Dave uh, project. The graphics designer was called Dave. And I'll see if I can play that to you now. So they did a 3D scan the designer um, from this 3d scan they, they made key points on the face so that they could simulate uh, emotions so you can see the slider bars move up and down and that that allows them to create uh, expressions And they're really quite realistic. 17 years ago, this was. And then they wanted to show physiological responses. This is show how uh, respiration rates change with uh, hard physical exercise. So it's normal respiration. You're doing a bit of heavy effort now. You can see in breathing heavier. And now he's exhausted and you can see and they were all able to do this 17 years ago with games technologies and so this was the exercise that they used to to simulate what a person uh, would look like dying from a head wound so this is uh, his normal self on the right hand side you can see uh, the head injury uh, the blood flowing uh, the color of his body how his body responds, it's all done through computer games technologies. And so if you are a medical practitioner um, and you want to understand what it's like when someone dies from a head wound, you're not going to give somebody a head wound to swash them. Uh, this is a far safer uh, and more effective way to train people to teach these things. And I'll show you what that what that project led on to. 
So all of the, the blood, the sweat, the skin pallor, automatically generated by uh, these uh, this games company's uh, technology. And that now he's, he's died. Um, so now this is this is something I did yesterday. And it, again, it's very new. Um, on my smartphone, I, I have a, a friend who lives here in Singapore and I got him to take lots of pictures of me with the smartphone uh, to make a 3D model of me. Um, and this is what the 3D model of me looks like. Um, so And this is just done with a smartphone. So is there my, my digital twin in 3D using a smartphone? Now, going back 17 years, the technology that they used to create Dying Dave, uh, it took mainstream mainframe computers hours to process that data. Uh, the medical scanner was extremely expensive. So we've come a long way uh, in the technologies available to create digital twins. That's the point about this. And uh, TrueSim then got involved in a project to, to, to train uh, junior doctors when they first come to university. Um, one of the problems that they, they have when they go into a hospital, into A&E, is because they don't have a lot of practical experience, it's difficult for them to uh, diagnose conditions. So what they did was to create a way of generating avatars of different age and necessities um, and applying uh, the, the the physical characteristics of a condition to those avatars so that uh, these trainee doctors could learn on an avatar rather than on a human being. So it cut down on the um, the, the level of errors that, uh, that happened. Uh, this is something that, that I did uh, for a presentation in, in Japan um, last year in October. Now, I don't speak Japanese, uh, and these technologies are, um, were quite new and emerging. So I it was an experiment. So uh, what I wanted to do was to deliver my presentation in Japanese. Uh, so I wrote the script in English, um, and I used avatars, my avatar, and an avatar of a nurse, uh, to deliver my presentation in Japanese. So I stood at the lectern and played the video, and this is what I'm going to, to show you now. So this is my assistant uh, speaking in Japanese which I did as a way of introducing me and before I handed over to my avatar in, in speaking in uh, Japanese. So as, uh, as, as Alvesa has already, already said, you know, she didn't need to come here. I could have done it with her avatar, and she could have uh, her avatar could have presented. Um, so, digital twins have many different uh, purposes. Uh, they use in, in in surgery. So, as we understand mechanics of the the body, we're not too far away from being in a situation with the use of robotic surgery. Uh, surgeons can effectively operate on an avatar, a virtual thing, but it, it's actually. The operation is taking place on 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 the real person, um, and you, I'm sure you're probably aware already. But um, robotic surgery has an enormous potential because it is uh, much more precise and accurate uh, than um, a human being is able to achieve. But they're also used um, increasingly, and the reason why these new drugs for coronavirus and other vaccines have been um, so quickly developed is because they're developed using digital twins. Uh, they have digital twins of um, our, our genetics, uh, and so they can um, experiment with the impact of drugs on the digital twins instead of in vitro uh, application. This allows much quicker development of, uh, of drugs. And in remote care, using the kind of technologies that I use to measure my own health, these are 
screenshots from uh, some of the devices I use. Sometimes I even have three devices. I have my, my Fitbit on one hand, I have a, a smartwatch on the other hand, and I have a, a ring on, on, on this finger. And these are different dashboards that tell me how good my, my sleep is, my heart rate variability. Uh, and these devices are becoming increasingly medical grade. So it means that um, it's a way of caring for people remotely. And a company in the UK uh, that I've worked with called Spirit Healthcare, um, they have um, done quite a bit of research to, to show how much money can be saved by keeping people out of hospital by being able to look up after them in their own home. Now, this is uh, the latest um, uh, technology that I'm trying. It's called Zoe. Um, and it's, um, it comes in a package. It comes in a yellow box. Uh, which has a, a blood sugar monitor called Freestyle Libra that you put into your arm. It has uh, another device which will take a blood sample from you. And it has a kit uh, that allows you to take a sample of your stools. Uh, so you send off the blood sample, you send off the stool sample. Uh, and in the laboratories, Zoe uh, essentially works out what your current blood health, your blood sugar levels uh, and your, your gut health are um, and whilst that laboratory process is taking place uh, Zoe gives you some exercises to measure your blood sugar response uh, so it begins with on day one uh, for breakfast you have three slices of white bread um, uh, uh, so three slices of white bread fast for three hours before you eat anything else on the second day you just have one avocado for breakfast. Again, fast for three hours um, and then live the rest of your day as normal. On the third day, you have three slices of bread and avocado. On the fourth day, you have three slices of bread and then you have 30 minutes of exercise walking. And on, on the last day, and I can't read quite read what it says, um, Yes, you have avocado, then you wait 10 minutes and have some bread. And the, the blood sugar responses are quite different for each of these. So it's actually telling Zoe what your personal capabilities are for being able to um, your blood glucose uh, response uh, levels. And, and so this data is then used to essentially create a personal diet for you. So now on my, on my Zoe app, if I open it up, um, if I tell it what I want to eat, it will give me a score. Uh, and so my, my, the aim of Zoe is actually to increase my uh, diet score. So it, does, it was not telling you is, is to be prescriptive about what you should eat, what it's saying is, is giving you little tips and advice to gradually improve uh, your diet, when you eat, what you eat, how much you eat, uh, and you can take your favorite foods and it will show you how you can improve your score by doing small changes to this. So this is uh, the latest iteration of um, these kinds of uh, technologies. Um, now here, here is the digital twin. <laughs> um, everything um, is done on um, a smartphone here. So, so it begins by taking a uh, picture. It begins by using my smartphone to create a digital twin. Uh, and then um, it finally finishes up uh, with an avatar that can talk. And this is how the animation is. And I'm not go going to go through all of this, but basically, all of this is on the smartphone. So I, I took the original picture of Alvesa. I used a program called Photo Leap, uh, which uh, then allowed me to um, basically, uh, I use a program called Photo Leap to be able to give a different background, different costume, etc. cetera. Um, and then the next step is to take that avatar, and this is what I did with Alvesa this morning, uh, put it into, uh, a web-based program called Yepic AI, um, and, and what it the, the end result um, is an avatar um, that will speak. The age of wearable technology, wellness, and healthcare management 
have been revolutionized by the widespread adoption of devices that track various aspects of our health in real time. These wearables, such as smartwatches and fitness trackers, empower individuals to take control of their well-being by one. So the script that uh, she delivers there, I didn't write a word of it. I used ChatGPT, and all I did was to type in the topic of her presentation and say, give me 100 words about wearable technologies and personal health management, and it wrote it for me. And I did the same thing whilst I was sat with her for five minutes this morning, uh, and she said, well, I can speak French. So I got it to speak French as well. So she has a, uh, an avatar that can speak uh, in French, uh, this is uh, an avatar of me. I'm not sure whether I look better as a as a 20th century century robot, uh, uh, but uh, again, uh, just to show that I'm I'm quite happy to do to show these things about myself. Twins and artificial intelligence AI have emerged as powerful tools for revolutionising medical and health applications by combining the capabilities of virtual modelling and advanced data analytics. These technologies offer unprecedented opportunities for personalized healthcare, disease prevention, and treatment optimization. Digital twins are virtual replicas of physical entities, such as organs, tissues, or even entire individuals. They capture real time data from a variety of sources, including wearable devices, medical sensors, and electronic health records. AI algorithms then analyze this data to generate insights and predictions enabling healthcare providers to make informed decisions. In the field of medical diagnostics, digital twins can simulate the behavior of specific diseases or conditions, aiming to improve detection and accurate diagnosis. By integrating disease information, lifestyle factors, and medical history, digital twins can create comprehensive profiles of data, enabling personalized treatment plans tailored to individual needs. Furthermore, digital twins and AI play a crucial role in drug discovery and development. By stimulating the effects of drugs for other ones, researchers can identify potential candidates more efficiently, reducing costs and time frames associated with traditional trial methods. This approach also enables the exploration of personalized medicine, where treatments are tailored to a patient who has the same number of physiology. Beyond diagnostics and drug development, Digital twins and AI are advanced to get us to improve the locate, monitor, and predict the data. Real time data from wearable devices, like sensors, can be fed out to digital twins, allowing healthcare professionals to monitor patients' job status completely. AI algorithms can detect the contents of all those on the website, trigger the collection of prevention and prevention hazards. In conclusion, the combination of digital twins and AI holds immense promise for medical and health applications. These technologies can help healthcare providers with advanced diagnostic capabilities, personalized treatment strategies, and variety of issues to ultimately lead to improved health. I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, I didn't write a word of that. <laughs> In fact, my abstract was written by ChatGPT. My abstract for this conference was written by ChatGPT. And when it generated the text, I thought, yeah, I, I agree with everything. I agree with everything you say. I couldn't put it better myself. And of course, that wasn't my voice. Uh, I, I had a choice of uh, voices, and this was a criticism that Alvesa uh, made of of the avatar's voice that I chose for in French because it sounded like a little girl when she was uh, when she was talking. Yeah, so that is my my presentation. I'm very happy to answer any any questions you may have, both from the physical and from the virtual audience.